This is Theatre Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. Here with me is my co-host, Michael Riedel of the New York Daily News. Taking Sides is a fascinating new play about the German conductor Wilhelm Furtwingler, who may or may not have been a Nazi sympathizer. Playing the German conductor is the terrific Daniel Massey, who is giving a performance that I'm certain will be nominated for a Tony next year. And we are delighted to be joined tonight on Theatre Talk by Daniel Massey. Welcome, sir. Nice to be here. Now, uh, I spoke to Ronald Harwood, who wrote this play, and he's uh, sort of on the fence about whether or not uh, uh, Ferd Wingler was really a Nazi sympathizer or if he just had to do it because of the circumstances at the time. But I've read interviews where you, with you where you think that uh, he was not, that uh, secretly he despised the regime and was working actively against it. Secretly despised it. He, he openly, publicly despised it. Uh -huh. uh, I, I think there's any, no question about that. Uh, but the, the point that, that Ronnie is making, I think, in writing the play in the first place, of course it has to do with the Nazi dictatorship and whether an artist should stay there or should run away and go and hide. But it's also about culture in general and what the art, what, 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 as, 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 as Furtwängler says at the end of the play, what kind of a world do you want to make? What kind of a world do you want to the major who's interrogating him? who is a man who wants to nail him for being a Nazi. An American prosecutor is that The American prosecutor. And I think that, that that is really Ronnie's great achievement, that he is called taking sides for a very good reason, that, it, that there, are, there are no firm black and white answers to these moral questions. I think that, and, and that Ronnie was determined to write the play around that. And I think he succeeded very well. But well, to you, which, which, where, do you, where do your sympathies lie? Well, I, it, 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 I don't think it's really a question of the sympathies lie. What I have to do as an actor is to find an, uh, uh, an empathy for, a respect for, a love for, if you like, for Furtwängler, if I can find it. Because if I can do that, I'm not going to pass moral judgments on him within the text of the play. I'm going to play the contradictions. I'm going to play the ambiguities. I'm going to play, therefore, a man who is the richer for it, for the, for, 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 for the, uh, for the audience. Now, when you say you have to find a love for him, where have you found that love in oh, this man? It's very simple. I, 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 I've heard a lot of his recordings uh, and have an, a, the deepest respect for him as a musician. I mean, all that nonsense in the, in the play about the eccentric beat. I mean, how can you make music like that and have a, have a beat that doesn't make sense? Furtwinkler always said that the downbeat was nothing. The downbeat, it's finished. It's the preparation for the downbeat. <laughs> That's the important Would you have been able to play him if you had found nothing about him beyond his artistry to admire? If you had I, I don't think I would have been able to play, uh, play him very well. I mean, I have to spend, of course there are areas where he is deeply contradictory. I mean, he's, uh, he's boxing very clever about Karajan, whom he did loathe. I mean, he says in the play, I stayed because I wanted to protect the musical tradition and I loved my country and my people and I wanted them to be able to come and listen to music and get away from the horror. Mm -hmm. And that was true, but uh, equally you could say that he had the conductorship of the greatest orchestra in the civilized world at the height of his powers. Mm -hmm. Maybe he stayed because to go would have meant five, 10, 15 years in the wilderness with no music. Right. So and yet so many. It's a yet, very yeah, the, the so thing I like about him in, in your performance is that he's an incredibly arrogant man who makes no apologies for being incredibly arrogant. Well, you find him arrogant. That's interesting. I, I, I think he is, but he, I think he also has an extraordinary humility. I hope a humility, too. But he's an artist, and he knows he's an artist, and he's oh. not going to be humble about his oh, artistry. Oh, I think that's absolutely right. And funnily enough, I think that's one of the difficult things I find playing it here, that the Furtwängler personality, persona, within that German musical tradition of the 1930s is quite foreign to audiences here, mm. I think. Mm. And it takes them quite a bit of time to get into the swing of things. And uh, I'm not so sure, really, that there's enough attention being paid to the, the sides of the question that aren't necessarily within the play, but have to do with culture. Culture as a necessity rather than a luxury. For well, instance, the New York Times talks about um, their arts section as arts and leisure. <laughs> it's very interesting. And I'm, I'm not so arts and sure that I'm, I have a great respect for the New York Times. Don't get me wrong. I'm they like so, you. I, 
<laughs> well, that, that's very nice. But, I, but I, I'm, I, it's the leisure side of it. Of course there is leisure to it, but yeah. there is also a necessity for it. Well, I think there's a lot of people who have trouble. They, they, we've always been, most of us raised, to draw the Nazi question in a black or white situation. And then yeah. here's this man who stayed on and enjoyed the fruits of being an, a popular artist. Well, I, I, I question that enjoying the fruits, you see. I mean, that's what the, the Ed says to mm -hmm. me uh, every night. And I have Ed Harris, who plays the Ed Harris, who plays the interrogator. Uh, I, I'm not so sure that that is really uh, uh, the fact. I think, in, in, in actually, I think it was a tragedy in his life, and I think it killed him prematurely by 20 to 25 years. I mean, I think he, and I, I actually think he would have done the same thing again if he'd been given the opportunity. He would have stayed. Mm -hmm. I don't think he would have gone. I think that he was genuinely, seriously in his soul telling that man the truth. Mm -hmm. If I didn't feel that, I don't think I could play it. Now, Ben Brantley uh, in the New York Times, who raved about your performance, uh, mm -hmm. I remember he began his review in sort of Walter Kerr-like fashion, where he described many paragraphs about what you do with your hands as the conductor who's not mm. conducting. I wonder if, if you've read that review, and if as an actor when you read that, are you suddenly conscious of my, what am I doing with my hands? What are these movements that they like? And does that become a block for you? Well, I, I don't think it becomes a block. I, 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 of course, it, it, it's, what's interesting is that when you work a part like this, you, the first the building block is the text. Everything else is peripherally useful, like books and archive film and dates and whatever. But the text is everything. And if you work the text, you find yourself working up into a man who is a conductor, into a man who doesn't come on till page 33. And when he does come on, if he doesn't surpass expectations, I He's knew been built up. rehearsal, you don't have a play. Yeah. Now, I didn't go purposely to say I must be big, but what you call the arrogance is something uh, Ronnie came up to me one day in rehearsals and said, you have the arrogance of fame about you, rather than the way Harold does, he said, <laughs> pointing at Harold Pinter, the director. And I said, do I? Now, those things happen, I think, through a kind of osmosis, mm -hmm. reading in detail and going through the script. So that these things, so uh, you have a pair of hands and you are a conductor. I mean, I find myself sitting, I do now when I'm on a stage, I sit often with my hand like that, which is holding the baton. Ready to go. And I suddenly found myself doing that. Yeah. And the way that, that, uh, that a conductor uses his hands, particularly Furt Fengler, who actually is, uh, I mean, I, my hands and arms are very loose because that's how he was. Yeah, well, that's great. The whole performance, you get a sense that he's conducting not just his life, <laughs> not just the music, he's trying to conduct well, his life. That's up to other people. That's <laughs> up to, I mean, Brantley sees, sees a big pair of hands. Now, you look at those, I don't think those hands are that big, are they? <laughs> Give me your hands, Alan. <laughs> Susan, oh, your yeah, hands are bigger than his. Are you You're a conductor? A beautiful girl, and you've got nice <laughs> slender hands. They're not that much smaller than mine. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm bigger than mine. And, and I, uh, I, but, but that's what he divines. And, and uh, that's, that's his privilege. And, I, and I, in a sense, one is flattered to find that that power is, is there. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's very nice. I mean, I've touched wood for that. That's very nice. Now, Taking Sides is uh, uh, only the third Broadway play that you've done, correct? You did She Loves Me, of course, for which you're very well yes, known. Yes, I did Small One, Murray Hill, Robert Sherwood's Potsdamuth play. Oh, I see. Uh, in 56, and then I did She Loves Me in 63. Gigi in 73 and taking sides in 96. So, and you spend most of your time in, in, in London where you live. All of it, really. Uh, but are you an American citizen or? No, no, I'm British. You're British. But you could have come over here and you could have stayed after she loves me. Why did you go back? Well, I, oh, I went back because my life is, is European. I, I grew up as a European. I was educated at a university in England, Cambridge, and I went to school there. Actually, I actually had a year at Eaglebrook, Massachusetts during the war, which was Sensational. I loved it. Now, if I'd stayed then, I think things might have turned out very differently. But I grew into a European, and I still crave that. I go to France a great deal. I have a property in France where, you know, and, and I, I, love you. I love Europe. I like that. I love this place. Don't get me wrong, but I, there's something about Europe, and particularly as an actor, 
at the National Theatre or the Royal Shakespeare Company, where available to me is world drama. Well, you could work in London on the stage. Oh, wow. New York and sometimes... If I go to California, go to Hollywood, I'm, they give me a bow hat and an umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite as interesting as Kurt Ferdwig. Well, that, 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 well, Wilhelm, <laughs> that's good. You, you, you've got, got that right. Away. That's good. That's very good. I got this far without yes, making that's mistake. very good. Daniel Master, you were terrific in taking sides, and we've been uh, delighted to have you as our guest today. Thank you both very much. Coming up, David Henry Huang. Let's hear the truth, Wilhelm. Come on. Let's come clean. What was your party number? If you are going to bully me like this, Major, then you had better do your homework. You obviously have no idea how stupid and impertinent your remarks hmm. are. David Henry Wong is a Tony-winning playwright best known for his big Broadway hit, M. Butterfly. He's got a new play opening this week at the Public Theater. It's called Golden Child, and it's about ancestors and traditions and the clash of cultures. David Henry Wong, welcome to Theater Talk. Thanks for having me. All right, I gave a little uh, teaser about uh, what Golden Child is about, but in the playwright's words, what are you trying to tell us in this one, David? Um, it's basically the story of my great-grandfather and how he converted to Christianity in China in 1918 and the effect that it had on his three wives. And it's based on stories that my grandmother told me. Um, and I guess at this point in my life, it was just important for me to go back to that because they uh, eventually adopted a, quite an evangelical or fundamentalist form of Christianity that I rebelled against uh, when I was younger. And now I sort of want to go back and look at how it is that they got to that place, hopefully in a more humanistic fashion, to sort of see the good and the bad that came out of that decision. Well, it's interesting that you say that, because I, I think you're right. You know, when, when, when you are you, you do kind of rebel and put down uh, what you were brought up with. But uh, as you've gotten older, you've, what, come to a more deeper understanding or sympathy for them? Uh, at least sort of empathy, a sort of understanding. I mean, it's not like I'm ready to go back and start speaking in tongues or anything like uh, when I was a kid, <laughs> but um, I think that I don't need to sort of demonize that decision. In some sense, it's fundamentalist even to have to be so opposed to a decision that you decide it's totally evil. And in some sense, the character in the play, uh, Tiang Bin, who's the father who makes the decision to convert, uh, is trapped in a fundamentalist mentality as well in that he is raised in a Confucian tradition, which is very rigid, and he wants to progress, he wants to go past that. And in order to do that, he has to find another big stick, you know, to beat back the old big stick with, and that becomes a very rigid form of Christianity as well. So I think I'm trying to not be rigid about this and not be rigid about my feelings, but try to uh, understand just where they're coming from, and it allows me to reconnect up with my ancestors in some, in some sense. You wrote about this fascinating household. This took place around 1909, um, right? 1918. 1918. Yes. And there's th the three wives. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is you portray your grandfather as being unhappy with that household, but the three wives find the th having three wives very convenient. Well, yeah, I mean, I think there's this impression that having a, a harem is, uh, you know, really a lot of fun for the guy. And I think it, it may be if the guy has absolutely no conscience, but if you have, like, half a conscience, then the idea that there's, it's sort of like a guy who's married and has a mistress. I mean, it's maybe fun well, in theory. So I was a little envious of him. <laughs> yeah, I, I think they're very attractive. But, um, but you know, it's, it's, it's inherently Machiavellian because you've got three women in the same household, all their kids, and they're all fighting for some sort of position right. for themselves and their children. And it creates a situation where, as the husband, he's constantly refereeing battles between right. everybody, and that becomes his life more than being able to have a real relationship with the wife that he really loves. Yeah. Yeah. It is a fascinating play directed by James, James Lapine, Lapine, right? Now, uh, M. Butterfly, of course, was your, your big, big hit play. Uh, <laughs> there was a sense in the theater community, and this, I think, happens to all playwrights who have a such a big hit that the guy might just be a sort of one-note playwright. Where's mm -hmm. the next great David Henry Wong play? And you came up with Face Value, mm -hmm. which was a play that uh, closed out of town in Boston. Right. Have you felt the pressure of uh, being the sort of one-hit playwright? What's he going to do next? And how have you dealt with that? Well, I think that uh, having a big commercial success, you know, everything has its advantages and disadvantages. And obviously, there's a lot of great things about having a Broadway hit, and I'd love to do it again someday. But um, <laughs> Make the, <you> rich. <laughs> the, yeah, the, the disadvantage is, yeah, there's a sort of a little devil that sits on your shoulder and says, um, now you have to do at least as well, if not top yourself, which is really extra artistic. I mean, that's not what the writing process or being a playwright is about. So in some sense, uh, to have a flop is really useful in that it sort of bursts that balloon and allows you to go back to being um, just a writer again, which is 
basically what I was before M. Butterfly when I did my first plays at the Public Theater. Mm -hmm. Now, face value was your response to the um, uh, Miss Saigon controversy when uh, mm -hmm. Actors' Equity denied Jonathan Price uh, initially the chance to play the uh, Eurasian in the show, and Cameron McIntosh threatened to close the show down, and you sided with the Equity's initial mm -hmm. decision. Yeah. Equity caved in on that uh, mm -hmm. eventually. Now they're in another tussle with Cameron McIntosh, <laughs> yeah. trying to protect some actors who were fired by him from Les Miserables. Uh, where do you stand on that question, and are you a little concerned that equity just may not have much of a backbone when it stands up to a heavyweight like McIntosh? Um, I think that, you know, in retrospect, first of all, let's talk about Miss Saigon. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I felt even uncomfortable about at the time was the idea of saying somebody can't do something. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think at heart I'm a civil libertarian, and so I basically feel that a producer does have the right to cast anyone that he or she would like. Um, but I also feel that people who don't like it have the right to complain as loudly as they want, and that's the best way to balance everybody's civil liberties. So out of that experience, I think someone now who would make the decision to cast um, a, uh, a Caucasian in a, in a part for an Asian or Eurasian, however you want to put it, um, would at least be aware of what, what's, what they're going to have to be dealing with. Um, and then if they choose to deal with it, then that's, that's, their, cho uh, you know, that's their call. Um, Regarding the situation right now with Les Mis, I have to say that uh, having been sort of battle-wearied uh, from the, uh, the initial <laughs> fight with uh, Cameron McIntosh, um, I'm not exactly sure what my position is on this. You know, I don't really know enough about the circumstances to, take a, to, to have a strong feeling about it. Uh, I do feel that equity, you know, actors in general, it, it's such a precarious life. And um, they have so little power in terms of what happens to them. I mean, I'm married to an actor, so I sort of understand the ups and downs of that career. And so the, to band together, uh, to form a union, supposedly, is, supposed, it, it, it's, you know, to create some sort of strength. And, and I think it's very difficult, uh, even in that context, for an actor to stand against somebody who creates so much employment right. and who is so powerful uh, in the industry. Yeah. yeah, you have to have the stagehands on your side if yeah. you want to fight the producers. <laughs> They're the most powerful people in the business. Yeah, somehow they make it happen. I do want to talk a little bit about Face Value mm -hmm. because it was an interesting play that uh, I never saw it in Boston, but I did, I did read it. Was your response mm -hmm. to the Miss Saigon controversy? It was quite funny. Mm -hmm. What went wrong? Why didn't it work out? I think it's, we were trying to write it to do a farce. And, um, it was an expensive play, too, like two expensive, and a half million. Right, I mean, they spent a lot of money on it, and Jerry Zachs directed it. Yeah. Um, Stuart Oster and Scott Rudin uh, produced it with right. Hugh Jamson. Um, and, you know, it was really, it was a great opportunity to try and make this thing happen. I think farce is, you know, what is that? Uh, dying is easy, comedy is hard. Right. Uh, farce <laughs> is extremely difficult. I think I knew that the play was going to need a certain amount of work. I mean, really a lot of work before we went into production. And there was this opportunity to get it on Broadway with Jerry. And I think I sort of hubristically felt, well, I can fix it in four weeks. I can mm. fix it in four weeks in Boston. Uh, in fact, we did get to town. We got into oh, the court. Yes, we right. played, I think, nine previews and then decided to close it. Right. But um, it's real. I mean, I take responsibility for that because I think that for whatever else uh, may have been wrong with it, the play wasn't right. And if the play's not right, there's no reason to expect that it would be able to do well. So mm -hmm. would you avoid that idea that I can fix it in rehearsals again? And I think I. I think it depends on the play. I mean, there's some right. plays. Uh, Butterfly was in a much closer to finished form when we went to rehearsal. And um, I think Golden Child was also. Uh, Face Value is, was a tricky play, and it just needed three or four workshops, and that didn't happen. Um, so now I have uh, immense respect. Now for you've gone back to the, uh, the uh, non-for-profit theater. Do you, yeah. Are you more comfortable at the public theater, not-for-profit, than you are in the snake pit that's Broadway? I have, you know, there's something obviously very exciting about Broadway, and it's, it's a lot of fun to be sort of reaching for a, a ring that's that high. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, I, I feel working, being back at the public, I didn't know how it would feel after all these years. And um, You started at the public. I started, here. I did my first four or five yeah. plays at the public when Joe was there. Um, Joe Papp. Joe Papp, right. And um, it's, it's been very relaxed. I mean, it's been really nice just getting to work on the play, and I go to go to rehearsal every day or I go to my office every day and just try to make the play better and all of the, again, sort of extra artistic pressures are much less. And of course, sure, in the back of everybody's mind there's the hope that we would get great reviews and we'd be able to have a run someplace in New York. 
Uh, but it doesn't, it's not as present as a day to day concern, and it's been really refreshing just to focus on the work. Did George C. Wolf come in and scrutinize the play? Mm -hmm. and George has and been give there. You his feedback? Yeah, George is great. You know, it's obviously he's immensely talented and smart, and it's great to have him there. And he comes, he's been, you know, he goes to a number of rehearsals, comes to a number of previews, and his input is really helpful. He's looking for the public's next to chorus line. He's going to hope it's going to be <laughs> Golden Child. Well, it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> from your mouth. Wouldn't that be <laughs> That's right. David Henry Wong, it's been a pleasure. The uh, play is called Golden Child. It is currently running at the Public Theater. Thank you. Thank you. you. Now, Michael, on this program last week, we talked about the Les Mis controversy, and yet it rages on. The actors have not let it go to rest. Right. Well, at this point, uh, uh, there's not too much to report. The, the uh, um, fight between Cameron McIntosh, the producer of Les Miserables, and the actors he fired from the show because uh, he wanted to uh, uh, shake the show up and improve it for its 10th anniversary in March. That controversy continues to smolder. Uh, I have been told, though, that um, McIntosh uh, is beginning to feel sufficiently provoked that he may exercise his right to close down the show for six weeks, and that, under the terms of the actor's, actor's equity contract, would make all the contracts null and void. He is now offering to pay these actors he's fired $25,000 severance. He would not have to pay them a dime. So if I were those actors, I'd button my lip and sit there and take my cash and be done with it. Now, you and I both sort of came up on the same side of this last week. But then we spoke to a lot of performers. For the a lot of performers who said, oh, no, this is outrageous, that actors cannot have this security. We had a big Broadway star here, a woman who said that she was indignant. She spoke off the record. It was indignant, you know, that, and, but I mean, the actors well, look, are you outraged. Know, actors, God love them, but they're not exactly the sharpest knives in the drawers. Uh, <laughs> the problem with actors, Susan, is that now, certainly you know, not nobody, all of them. nobody, as we've discussed before, nobody, nobody should come to Broadway thinking that they're guaranteed a job for life. If you want that, then get a job in the post office or go work for the civil service. It seems to me that, that uh, it's against the spirit of acting to stay in a role, unless you're kooky like Carol Channing, for <laughs> your entire career. Unless you're lucky like Carol and Channing. And you know what? The people who were fired, if they were really good, they would have moved out of that show a long time ago and they would have moved up the ladder. Well, now, of course, but they stayed. purely the opinion of And Michael they got fat Riedel and lazy and they were and fired. And not the producers of theater <laughs> talk. But now, didn't you say that, for instance, you talked to Sarah Jessica Parker and she said she'd be willing to Sarah stand. Jessica Parker, yes, who's starring in Once Upon a Mattress, told me that she would be willing to strike. Easy for her to say. She's probably making about $15,000 a week and makes money from movies. So she, but she'd be willing to strike, she said, go out there on the picket lines because we actors have to stick together and stand up for our rights as artists. Well, what are your rights? I mean, your rights are basically a clean workspace, a decent salary, a living wage, all those things. Your right is not to spend your entire life in one Broadway show. So now, Cameron McIntosh. While we're on the subject. While we're on the subject. We should talk about Cameron's new show, which is Martin Gare, a big new musical written by the same guys who wrote Les Miserables and Miss Saigon. That show opened in uh, London in July and got terrible reviews. It's a six million dollar show. Cameron, of course, would love to bring it to Broadway eventually. Um, but the show was devastated by the British critics. Cameron has taken the unusual step, the unprecedented step, I think, of shutting the show down for a couple of days two weeks ago. <laughs> this is a big tactic of <laughs> That's right. That's, he's on to say, <laughs> the keep new. the shut shows down. To fix the show, he, he brought the authors back in and the director, and they went to work on the show. They wrote a couple of new songs for the first act. They shaved some uh, boring stuff out of the second act. He has reopened it for the British critics, and at, unfortunately, when we're taping now, they have not seen the show yet. But I'm told that uh, if the show doesn't, still does not get good reviews, he is going to close it down by the end of the year, and we will never see Martin Gare on Broadway, which, since I just got the cast album, I think it's terrible, maybe a blessing. What happened to that Cameron, Cameron McIntosh production of uh, Oliver? With John oh, Price. that's a big hit in London. That's still a big hit in London. He, he may or may not bring that to New York. I know there have been quite a few revivals of Oliver over but the last few years. But this is Jonathan Price. It'd be fabulous. Jonathan Price, but I don't think he would come to, to New York with it. Too bad. Yeah, but I'd love but to I see understand that. that's a good show. All right. So now you went off and saw By Jeeves. Yes, that's the new Andrew Lloyd Webber musical. Mm -hmm. Actually, a strange for Andrew Lloyd Webber. It's a small, intimate little musical based on the P.G. Woodhouse novels about Jeeves the Butler, Boot, uh, Bertie Wooster, the uh, the upper class Englishman. Uh, it was. Jeeves is a show that Andrew Lloyd Webber wrote uh, in the 70s with Alan Akeborn, the, the British playwright, and it was a flop uh, in the West End. And Andrew is not able to let uh, any of his failures uh, uh, rest as failures. He's a constant tinkerer. He likes to go back and see if he can make them into hits. So he and Akeborn revisited uh, Jeeves. They wrote a whole, Akeborn wrote a whole new book for it. 
Uh, now, Andrew had used a lot of the songs in the original production for later shows. In oh, fact, a couple of tunes from Sunset Boulevard came from the original production of Jeeves. He's written a new score for By Jeeves, and I have to say, having seen this production uh, at the Goodspeed uh, Opera House in Connecticut, uh, the best thing about it is Andrew's music. It's not this lush, romantic, Puccini rip-off stuff that he does, but uh, more like um, Sandy Wilson's The Boyfriend, uh, sort mm -hmm. of <clears throat> uh, very light, uh, uh, fizzy, 1920s British music hall style. Uh, a lot of terrific songs in it. I still feel, though, that the book is, uh, uh, by Akeborn is confusing, a little bit difficult to follow. It's too long. And uh, Akeborn's directions, while at times he was inventive, I thought he was directing the actors to be a little too much over the top for my taste. Do you think they'll break it to Broadway? Well, it's an, it's an interesting question. You know, I'm told uh, by uh, someone in the Andrew Lloyd Webber camp that Andrew Lloyd Webber would love to have five shows on Broadway at the same time. He's got Cats, Phantom, Sunset Boulevard, Whistle Down the Wind, of course, is coming in the spring. I, I and he'd like to have By Jeeves on Broadway, too. I mean, why not? The man has already conquered uh, I America. Think, he might I think as that's well what David Henry sure Wang just called extra artistic. You know, <laughs> right. I mean, that is, is your artistic motivation that I'll have five shows? Well, but why not? I mean, i got to tell you, By Jeeves is better than Big, so why not have a good show? Isn't it sad that someone who's as successful as Andrew Lloyd Webber then becomes Oh well, I have to have five Broadway shows. No, I don't I mean, think. Can't he be well, happy? What's, what's sad? <laughs> what's sad? You just want him to share some of his loot with you. What's sad about that? He shows as many Broadway shows as, as the public is willing to see, and so far they seem eager to see all of them. So why not? So why not? We're out of time. Michael, a pleasure. We'll see you next time on Theater Talk.